All right, it's Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, talking of the Mason Blue. Uh, of course, Michigan goes to work here in just a few weeks, along with just about everyone else in week one. We got Steve Dace on the line from Michigan Podcast, and certainly encourage all of you to head on over there for the best uh, Michigan breakdown that you will find anywhere with a big focus on football, of course, but the other sports as well. Steve, how are you doing today? I'm excited, brother. It's almost here. The long wait is almost over, and uh, I'm psyched. I'm ready for the start of the season. I don't know about you. Yeah, if you love these other sports, uh, specifically the NBA or Major League Baseball, the offseason's about a blink of an eye, but in college football, it's longer than any other. So, boy, I am ready. We have talked ourselves out. It will be <laughs> fascinating and, and, and certainly a, a welcome change when you can actually talk about what you just saw on the field and what you're anticipating to see the next Saturday. Steve, I'm going to start this off on a bit of a different note. I believe you have told me several times that Jim Harbaugh was your all-time favorite and is your all-time favorite Michigan player. Correct. Um, I mean, I, I wore uh, two numbers every chance I had, or three numbers. In any sport, I played them all growing up, were the main ones. And I tried to wear number nine in baseball as much as I possibly could for Roy Hobbs and uh, The Natural, one of my all-time favorite movies. I tried to wear 41 in basketball uh, as often as I could uh, for Glenn Rice. And then when I used to play, uh, uh, you know, football or play video games with football avatars and I'd make myself on the Madden or NCAA football games, I always gave myself number four for Jimmy Harbaugh. So, yes. So the adage goes that uh, you should never meet your hero because then you're going to ultimately be disappointed. Or maybe you should never have your hero on the playing field become the head coach. <laughs> your your feelings toward Jim Harbaugh, are they any different? Because by all metrics, as we've discussed, for the logical, reasonable fan would be that he has upgraded this program significantly in five years. But there's the major disappointment of the big game letdowns. Well, I'm a parent, Mark. So uh two teenagers and a third on the way. So compartmentalization is becoming my jam. And then my full-time job, I work in politics. So I'm used to disappointment. <laughs> I'm, I'm well conditioned on both of these fronts. So uh, nothing will dissipate how much I loved uh, Jim as a player. It's, it's where I, it's, it's the era I came of age as a Michigan fan growing up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And, and he was the face of the team and he had a swagger and they, those were some of Bo's best teams. So nothing can change that. And, you know, as an adult, you learn how to draw distinctions. Now, there's an important distinction for him in, in, in terms of his head coaching tenure at Michigan. You know, the decade before he arrived, Michigan barely averaged seven wins a season. They were already halfway into their longest championship drought in the history of the program, which has been extended by four years uh, since he took over, obviously. Uh, and they've, they've been ranked in the AP top 10, if you count the preseason poll that just came out today. Michigan has already now been ranked in the AP top 10 more times in the in the five seasons. This is the fifth year for Jim Harbaugh than it was the entire decade before he arrived. So from 2005 to 2014, uh, they were in the AP top 10 fewer times than they have been since he got here. The season before he got here, we were a national laughing stock. We were literally giving away tickets if you bought a Coke Zero on campus. Students were rioting on campus to get rid of the coach and the AD. We were a disaster, man, a total dumpster fire. So there's no question we're a vastly better program. Bill Bender at the Sporting News has often pointed out he's got the seventh or eighth best record in college football since he took over. If you if you take away, I'm not so much, you know, if you're a Michigan fan, you don't, you don't sweat bowl losses anyway. You've been doing them your whole life. But historically, the years we lose to Ohio State in the history of the program, Mark, We've only won 30% of our bowl games those years. So what that tells you is the losing to Ohio State typically just, you know, Michigan kind of puts so much into that, what that means for defining their season that whatever comes after that, they're just, they're just not that into you. Right. So, you know, the, the losses to in, in the last couple of bowl games, I mean, I didn't enjoy them, but you know, I don't know how re relevant those are right now. Uh, I mean, everybody's talking up Texas because they beat Georgia in the Sugar Bowl, and yet everybody thinks Georgia is going to be better than Texas this year with a lot of the same players. So, the 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 if you take away the four losses to Ohio State, though, to Urban Meyer, he's thirty eight and ten. 
That's 82 or 38. And, yeah, 38 and 10. That's Jim Trestle, like 82% win percentage in the Big Ten. And that would be the best winning percentage by a Big Ten coach with at least five years of experience since Bo Beckler retired. The, the top two winning percentages by a Big Ten coach with at least five years of experience since Bo left in 1989 are both Buckeyes. Jim Trestle's number two, Urban Meyer number one. So if you take out losing to an all-time great coach who left here with a 90% win percentage, he's getting 10 against everybody else. So this year is going to be a real big determiner, I think, in that is, is, is it that he just couldn't beat Urban Meyer or he just can't take the next step as a coach with the Michigan program. And we're going to learn a lot about that this year. It remains to be seen. We've got Steve Dace on the Lion Michigan podcast. Please join him on all the uh, audio platforms, plus here on YouTube as well. Uh, Steve, I distinctly remember your theme following 2017, preparing for 2018 being okay. After that circus of airs and blowing a double-digit lead against a team that you should have blown out in South Carolina, I, I just give up. I see the recruiting rankings. I know the talent's better. I know we're better, but I need to see it. I can't say anything necessarily of any weight until I actually see them back on the field. Of course, you had to talk because that's what you do and that's what you love to do and people uh, want to hear it. But what has been the theme following another Ohio State loss, another failed uh, quest toward a championship? maybe not even taking into account the Florida game because there were certain conditions involving players missing the game that tampered with that score, I believe. But just in regards to your theme about playing it through this offseason and it meaning anything to you, what you've heard, what you've seen reported about Michigan's progress during the offseason. Well, last year, Michigan went 10-2, and two, the exact record. I predicted them to half. I predicted they'd lose to Notre Dame and at Michigan State. And they lost to Notre Dame, ended up beating Michigan State. So it was pretty much the team that I thought it was going to be uh, last year. The, the loss to Ohio State, I mean, there's some, there's some tremendous Michigan teams historically that have gone into Columbus and come out of there with a loss, just as there have been some all-time great Ohio State teams that have gone into Ann Arbor and come out of there with a loss. It's not the, the losing to Ohio State, um, especially knowing about that game, what we know now, Urban last game. Um, hearing all week a team you've owned is going to kind of come in there and own you. That's a huge motivational chip. They, they got, they, I mean, Ohio state, like a near death experience the week before against Maryland. I mean, if that two point conversion works, it doesn't matter if Ohio state beats Michigan, 139, Michigan's going to Indianapolis. Right? So when you throw in all of those intangibles and I remember texting uh, Michael Spath, who works with me over at Wolverine digest.com before the game and I watched a lot of the stuff, you know, on Periscope videos and uh, a lot of the, the game day feeds from on the field during warmups. And man, Michigan just looked really tight to me. Like maybe too much self-awareness, you know, they were way maybe too much aware of kind of the situation that was at stake. Um, it was the 62 to 39. You know, you go in there and lose even by maybe a touchdown or two, but it was competitive the whole way, but it was humiliating. Devin Bush got knocked out of the game. David Long got knocked out of the game. Um, you know, they're 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 down. They they kept it within one score until about the last quarter and a half. And they're still back there running play action pass, back quarterback, you know, back to the line of scrimmage, five, seven step drops. You know, it's like it's like watching, you know, film of both teams in the 70s, where that famous play against Indiana with Anthony Carter where they beat Lee Corso in the last play of the game, they ran a play action pass with two seconds left. Like the Indiana linebackers thought Michigan was going to run the ball there, Mark. Okay. But that's what passing games were back in the day. So go back and watch that game, man. Chase like doing play action pass, seven step drops. He turns around and, you know, Chase Young's down his throat. What the hell was that? Okay. It was so humiliating. I did something I have never done before as a Michigan fan. And I lived through Brady Hoke, Rich Rod. I didn't finish the game. I turned it off and I took my son to go see Creed 2 because I knew if I stuck around for the end of this, I was going to say some stuff that got me banned on every damn social media platform. I just had to go. That was, I, I wasn't alive in 1968. You know, the famous game for Bump Elliott's last game where they were one versus four. And, um, 
similar hype to this one went down there. Is this the year that Bump's going to get over the 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 hump against uh, against Woody Hayes? And it's it's fifty to fourteen, and he puts the starters back in to go for two. And at the end of the game, Joe Falls from the Detroit News famously asked Woody, "Why'd you go for two? And he said, "Because I couldn't go for three. All right, so I wasn't alive in 1968, so I don't know what it was like, and we didn't have social media and stuff back then. But that was the most humiliating experience I've ever had as a Michigan fan. Um, we just got completely emas- emasculated, denuded in every way. And and this wasn't because the other team, yeah, you can't play man against a team that's got three guys running sub four three forties at the combine. But it's not like there's a d- d- giant talent gulf here. This isn't Jim Tressel in year four against Rich Rod with Tate Forcier. All right. They even covered the spread, by the way, with Tate Forcier. It was, uh, this was, this was humiliation. And it, it clearly caused an existential moment for the Michigan program. That with Jim Harbaugh, with the move that he made with Josh Gaddis and the offensive evolution that's fully underway in Ann Arbor. So that's why I think this year, this year's going to kind of tell us a lot about where we're at as a program. So for the uh, hundreds, I would say, if not thousands of comments that I've received to my channel concerning the game edition number 2018, uh, year of 2018. And obviously that's what was going to happen. We all knew that. And only a small fraction of those people actually stated anything close to that prior to the game. I match up all the results of all the common opponents and say, no, these two teams are not what we saw on the field in Columbus that day. We see what Michigan was able to do against Maryland and Nebraska and on down the line, Penn State, that Ohio State could not duplicate anything close to that performance. There was reason to believe that Michigan was the better team after 11 games and should have taken care of business in Columbus. So I don't know how that translates to this year, but uh, the, the one thing I will throw out there is In the media's evaluation of how this is going to play out this year, there seems to be more focus on Ohio State. What Ohio State doesn't have this year, doesn't have the 50-touchdown quarterback most likely, doesn't have the all-time great coach. The, the, The focus has not been on what Michigan does or doesn't have. So for me, in the pro Michigan camp is Shea Patterson in a new offense with all these playmakers who knew nothing but the spread formation and wide open football air raid type style in high school and an offensive line that's gone from good to possibly great, maybe the best in the Big Ten. So that's my pro Michigan side of why they can make this happen. My anti-Michigan side, aside from the psychology of it, is that I don't know that this defense is going to be as good as it's been for the last three or four years, just because of the the massive talent that exited uh, this off season. I think Notre Dame had the highest ranked total defensive team in the playoffs last year at 12th, I believe. So this is a different era now. Um, and they're not going to be as good defensively. And I don't think it has much to do with Rashawn Gary and Chase Winovich, actually. I mean, Programs like Michigan and Ohio State, okay, you may not have a, a Joey or Nick Bosa, but you're going to then have a Jashawn Cornell and a Chase Young. Hutchinson was the MVP of the Army Bowl two years ago. Okay, so, um, you know, Quiddy Pay was a better player than Rashawn Gary last year. Played a lot when Rashawn Gary was hurt. He was better last year. At the end positions for teams like Ohio State and Michigan and Clemson and Alabama, um, well, I would throw Alabama. Alabama is at a level right now where you lose a Jonathan Allen and you have a Quinn and Williams. It's that interior disruptor. You know, Ohio State's ends are great. You don't have a Draymond Jones interior disruptor this year. That Those are so rare. There's only a couple of programs. Even Clemson, I've listened to lots of interviews with their beat writers. They're like, listen, guys like, I think it's Xavier Alford is his name or one of those guys. We're not going to miss a beat from him to the guys we had there before. We don't have another Christian Wilkins or Dexter Lawrence, though, pushing the interior of the pocket. You know, but ends are really, for elite recruiting programs, you're going to find new defensive ends. You're going to get those every year. I'm not I'm not worried about replacing Chase Winovich or Rashawn Gary. The, the reason they're going to be worse defensively is they're going to play a hell of a lot more snaps now, Mark. I mean, they're going to be on, def- on, on the field more. This is not going to be a team that's going to value time of possession, 
Uh, they're they're going to do almost a total 180 in terms of their pace of play. So when you're when you're on the field more defensively, you're just going to be worse defensively. That's one of the reasons why Notre Dame had the, the at number 12, the best total defense last year. You know, Clemson and Alabama's offenses were so explosive, they were getting out to such huge leads. Their defenses were on the field more. Their backups were on the field more. Um, that was somewhat similar with Ohio State last year. You go from this power spread with Urban Meyer where the, the quarterback power run game, everything feeds off of that. And now you're running a modified air raid with a Dwayne Haskins playing sandlot ball. And you've got these receivers against man coverage where they, you know, they, they outrun an angle or break a tackle, then they're housing you. Um, and that exposed a young defense um, a lot more on the field than they had been. So that, that's going to happen to Michigan too. I mean, Don's been here for three years. We've had, we haven't had a defense finish lower than number three. I don't think we'll even have a top 10 defense this year. My guess would be we'll be somewhere in the top 20. But it, but that doesn't matter in college football as much as it did 10, 15, 20 years ago. If you are not prepared to win on any given week, 45 to 37, you're not winning a national championship. That's just the, you're not making the playoffs. That, that's just the reality of the world of college football that we live in today with the rules and what, what's a tackle, what's a, you know, what's a targeting um, uh, you know, up-tempo offenses, you know, really, you know, the, the amount of uh, blocking downfield you can do in, in college compared to the NFL, all of those rules, nuance, you need to tilt more to being more of an offensive program than a defensive one. I mean, look at Oklahoma. They couldn't freaking stop a cold. The last They've been in the playoffs or a playoff contender every year of the playoff era. So that's the world that we live in today. And Michigan is now joining that world. So um, I, I think Michigan's going to be about as good as they were last year. It'll just look differently. The offense will be better. The defense will take a step back, kind of change places.